1 Corinthians chapter number 10. Part of the chapter I'm going to be focused on, actually the, the title of my sermon this morning is coming from verse number 12. Verse number 12, Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. The title of my sermon is take heed lest you fall. I think it's a great sermon to start off the new year. A lot of people are, um, you know, making resolutions or making um, goals, and I think all that stuff is great. And if you weren't here last Sunday night, I recommend listening to that sermon. I went in depth on, on um, you know, just kind of pushing it out and be able to do things for God, especially going into the new year and be able to achieve more and just push yourself harder to do more things. But I want to start off this year, and I want to start off this morning just kind of preaching on the subject of we need to all take heed to ourselves. We've got a great church here. We've got wonderful people here. But the, the more you serve God, and, and actually the, the, the longer you've been saved, the longer you've been a Christian, the more you've been doing stuff, the more you've got to take heed to yourself, lest you fall. Amen. I've been in church for quite a while now, in good church, and in, in, in church where I've seen a lot of growth. I've seen people come, and I've seen people go. I've seen people get on fire for God, serving God every single day, and I've seen those same exact people that you would never think in a million years that they get out of church, out of church. It happens. And we need to all individually make sure that we're taking heed to ourselves lest we fall. I'm going to reread some of this passage that we just read, keeping that in mind. Look at verse number one. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea and did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ. And he's using the imagery of, of, of what happened when they passed through the sea and everything that happened saying that these people, look, they all went through the same thing. They're all part of the same group. This is like, you know, the, the church in the wilderness. And essentially, we could be looking at this New Testament and saying, hey, these people all knew God. They all knew Christ. They, they were all believers, right? Now, we know that not every single individual in that whole group but was, you know, was necessarily saved. But this is the point he's making. This is the analogy he's showing. He said, look, they all went through the same thing. They were all baptized. They were all part of that group. They all followed the Lord. They, they drank of that spiritual rock, which was Christ, you know, implying their salvation. We can look at that today. Hey, we're all here, believers in Christ. We're all here. We've all been baptized. We've all, we're all saved. We're all here following Christ. But look at verse 5. But with many of them, God was not well pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. This is the warning. Saying, yeah, hey, look, as a group, we're all here saved this morning, right? I mean, I don't know every individual heart, but that's what we're here for. We're, we're congregated together as a group of believers. We're saved this morning. But we need to watch out because just as there was other people in the past that were all following the Lord and, and following Christ, God was not well pleased with many of them. We need to make sure that we're not falling into that group of God being not well pleased with us. Look at verse number um, 6. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. He's saying what happened to them and everything that's written in Scripture about the Exodus and the children of Israel wandering in the wilderness and all the sins that they got into, it's not just history. It's not just a record. It's given there for examples for us. He said everything that happened to them and the things that we read about and the things that they did and the way that they lusted after various things and the way that they complained and everything that they went through, those things are our examples. We need to learn from those things and we need to make sure we don't fall into those same traps so that God is not well pleased with us. Verse number seven, neither be ye idolaters as some of them. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Now, when we typically think of idolatry or an idol, most commonly in the Bible, it's just referring to a piece of wood that's carved into some kind of an image and it's graven, it's overlaid with some silver, or with some gold, and people will bow down and worship that image as if it's a god. And that's accurate and that's correct. But there's a much broader sense of the term idolatry. 
it goes deeper. It goes, it goes a little wider than just having, because today there's not many, I mean, there's some people in the world that still do something like that. I've seen these figurines of like a Buddha and people actually literally get on their knees in front of it or some other figures of, of some imagined God. But idolatry can affect us even if it's not just making an idol. The reference here, yeah, it was the reference of Aaron making the golden image, that golden calf. But when it brings up the idolatry, what does it say? The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. In reference to their idolatry. What they do? They forgot, they, they forgot about serving God and doing the work that the Lord has for them. And all they did care about at that point is became these hedonists. They just cared about whatever feels good. Oh yeah, we just want to have fun. There's nothing wrong with getting a little entertainment. There's nothing wrong with, with blowing off a little steam. You know, you work real hard. We should have a, some time to be able to rest. But we need to be very careful that that rest doesn't just turn into forsaking doing things for God and just like the children of Israel did, oh, they sat down to eat and drink and they just rose up to play and that's what their life's about. And that's what everything becomes about. Let's keep reading here because it goes on. Neither let us commit fornication as some of them committed and fell in one day three and 20,000. That was God's judgment as a result of their fornication. 23,000 people died. That's a lot of people to die for a sin. I mean, that's, that's, it shows us, these are examples for us, mind you. These are our examples. We need to, to get right in our hearts how serious these sins are. Neither let us tempt Christ, verse 9, as some of them also tempted and were destroyed of serpents. Neither murmur ye as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. Look at all these various sins. I mean, just murmuring. They're complaining. And what happened? God killed them. They fornicated. What happened? God killed them. They tempted Christ as some of them tempted. And what happened? They were destroyed of serpents. These things are serious. We can't let them creep into our life. We need to keep it at bay as far away as possible. You know, the Bible says flee fornication. I mean, you need to go run in the other direction from fornication. You need to get, you know, make sure that you're not just getting this soft spot and putting this up in front of your eyes and allowing yourself to view everything and be desensitized to it and think it's not that big of a deal because that's where the sin starts. That's when it becomes an option for you. Verse number 11, Now all these things happened unto them. Again, look. All these things happened unto them for our ensamples. And they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, so because of this reason, because, look, they went through all this stuff. They're examples for us to look at, to learn from, to not fall into the same trap. Therefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. Oftentimes there are people that they think they're going, everything's going great. And what happens when you start thinking everything is going well, there's no way I would ever do that sin. You start to get a little bit lifted up and your guard goes down. And we need to make sure that our guard isn't going down in many areas of our life. Many of you already know this. I made a, I made a personal vow to God um, one night about not ever touching alcohol again. Never going to drink it again. And I've kept that vow. Praise God. I'm, I'm thankful. Like, from that moment that I made that vow, I've never had another sip of alcohol. But I can't just say, oh, well, no, you know, I'm pastoring a church. I, you know, I'm so far above that sin that I don't even have to worry about it anymore. That's a foolish attitude to have. I need to take heed to myself. That's just one example. That's one real simple, basic example, something that I used, especially, you know, and especially the things that you used to do, that you used to be, a, maybe used to be a problem for you, watch out for those things. Take heed to yourself. Don't allow yourself to... Because here, here's the way it happened. I could say, I'm so far above ever drinking again that it wouldn't even be that big of a deal. I could, you know what? I could just go out to the bar and I could just hang out around this stuff. I could go to these parties and everyone else could be drinking around me and I'm so strong, I wouldn't, I, I'm not even going to think about it. That's the farthest thing from my mind. 
And that's foolishness. Because you start, you start getting lifted up in your own strength, thinking that, that you're so powerful. You know what's going to happen? You get worn down. It's going to happen. You get worn down over time. And you need to take heed to yourself, lest you fall. Verse 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. You're not the only one that goes through these things. There's, everybody goes through these same types of temptations in their flesh, the same desires, the same desire to, to, to do whatever that's, that's uh, appealing to your flesh. Everybody has that. We all have a, a sinful flesh. And the same, basically the same things appeal to, to everybody. Some more than others. Some people are drawn to one thing more than another, but it's not unique to you. There are many, many, many other people that have those same exact desires. There are no temptation taken you such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able. God's not going to allow you to go through certain temptations that, that you're not able to handle. He says, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. But I'll tell you what, if you are willingly putting yourself in those situations to just allow those temptations to happen, see, God's not going to allow you to go through those things just you know, by chance or by, by getting into certain situations that, that you have no control over necessarily. But if you're going to willingly be putting yourself into these situations, the temptation can very easily overcome you. And here's the thing that also, though, about this is that this verse proves that it's only going to be your own fault when you do fall. Yeah. God is not responsible for this. Oh, but God, you know, God didn't say that. Look, he made, otherwise this verse is a lie. He says, there's a way out for you. There's always a way to escape. He is not going to allow your suffer you to go through some temptation that you can't handle. Some testing, some trial. He's not going to let it happen. So when you fall, guess who's not responsible? God's not responsible. You are responsible for yourself and for your own actions. Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. There's that word flee. Again, just like I said, I mentioned earlier, flee fornication. The Bible says flee from idolatry. No Christian is above backsliding. Many things can become an idol in your life. And this is one of the things that we see mentioned here multiple times is idolatry. We saw earlier in verse 7, don't be idolaters. You know, some people, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Many things can become an idol in your life. Anything that you're putting basically before God, something in the place of God can be an idol in your own life. Now, we're called to be separate from the world. We're, you know, we're supposed to be sanctified. We're supposed to be a, a peculiar people. We're supposed to be set apart and meet for the master's use. We are not supposed to be of the world. We're not supposed to be like the world. When, when people look at you as a Christian, you ought to stand out and there ought to be things that they could visibly see that are different about you than just anybody else in this entire world. You're not supposed to be lumped together with everybody else. You may know that we're supposed to be separate, but some people, you might just want to cling on to those worldly things that you like. You just might want to just hang on to that rock music or the rap music or the R&B, whatever the, the world, whatever the world's garbage that they're putting out and trying to fill your brains with crap. You just like it so much and you just want to hold on to that. Watch out because that could be an idol. When you realize these things are wrong, when you realize it's wicked, when you realize the agenda behind what's being put out, and you say, you know what? I still want to listen to this. Watch out because it's become an idol. Or you cling to the, to the movies and the TV shows that you know are wicked. Like, they just came out with a new Star Wars movie, didn't they? Yes. Yes? Yeah? I, mean, I thought it's like... You see advertisements, right, all over the place? That's something that, that has a, a lot of following, and a lot of people love those movies, and a lot of people watch those movies. But you know what? Those movies are wicked. They promote all kinds of, of this, this, this what, a weird type of religion. I mean, the, with, with the Jedis and, the, and their, their force and the power that they have, look, it, it's underlying. A lot of it's very subtle. 
But the subtle stuff can be the worst stuff. Right. Don't think that it's not teaching you something. You say, oh, it's just science fiction. Oh, it's just a story. It's just fiction. Watch out. Those things have a lot of it. They can have a lot of influence on the way that you think. Let him that thing that he standeth take heed lest he fall. Or maybe you just want to cling on to that occasional drink. You know, the Bible says that, that we shouldn't even be looking. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 23, Look not thou upon the wine when it is red, when it, when, it, when it giveth its color in a cup, when it moveth itself aright. Don't even look at it. It's poison. It's a poison of, of asps, the Bible says. It's, it's like snake poison. It's venom. It's not something any Christian, any believer should be partaking in at all. But some people, they just like it so much, they just want to have that cocktail. They want to go out. When, oh, we just had New Year's Eve last night, right? And so many people are going out and just getting drunk in their celebration. Thinking that that's called having a good time. And say, oh, I don't, I'm not a drunk. I don't get drunk all the time. But I want to still have my drinks. Be careful when you realize something is wicked, especially when, when you get into this, this willful sinning. Because all these things I'm mentioning now, I'm briefly bringing it up. I preach entire sermons proving from the Bible why, you know, what Hollywood's putting out is wicked, why what the, the rock stars and musicians are putting out is wicked, and why, you know, alcohol definitely is wicked. Hopefully, you've been able to see that from the Bible, but once you already have that knowledge, once you already know, but then you decide to just, no, I still want to keep doing that. Watch out because that becomes an idol for you. And you know what? Those are just a few random things. It could be anything. Maybe I didn't hit your particular weakness, your particular part of your flesh that is just really appealing to you. But we need to take heed because here's the thing. A little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. Right. A little bit. You start allowing some sin into your life. You start just saying, eh, well, it's not that bad. I'm just going to let this happen. I just really like this. You know what's going to happen? It's going to get worse and worse. And it's going to grow into other areas of your life that you didn't intend it to. You just wanted to keep this one little pet sin over here. Because you like it, you don't want to get rid of it, and, and you're in the flesh, and you just want to have that thing. This is the way it always starts. And look, I'm speaking from experience with the people that I've known personally. People that I love. Great soul winners. I mean, people that, like I said, never in a million years would you think so-and-so is going to get out of church. No way. They're faithful. They come to all the church services. They're going out soul winning every single week. I mean, they're on fire for God. They're listening to the preaching. They've really changed their lives. And then months go by, maybe even years go by, all of a sudden, and see, here's the thing. When you start to realize that things have already been happening, one of the first things to go is maybe they start missing some of the soul winning times. Because that's extra, right? I mean, it's like, it's like they're still coming to church. But all the other things they were doing starts to drop off. And then their church attendance starts to get more sporadic. And before you know it, they're just out completely. And before you know it, you see them on Facebook just living out in the world like everybody else. But you know where that all starts from? It starts from something else. It starts from something, so their, their own little sin that they got in their life that they want to hold on to and Again, I've witnessed it. I'm not going to bring up any examples by name for sure because, uh, you know, there's no point in that whatsoever. But I, you know, just believe me when I tell you I've seen it happen. And, and, I've, and I've even found out where a lot of the source comes from. Where people got rid of something in their life, some sin, something that they, they like to do, and then it came back. And it, and it grew. And it grew and grew and grew. And that's the way that sin always works. It starts off small. It starts off with the eyes and with the mind. And then it spreads. See, people don't, don't automatically start off doing like fornication. You don't just start off just, you just run into someone and then boom, you're, you're going to bed together. It starts off more with thinking about other people, thinking about things, maybe looking at pornography, maybe looking at, at, at other people. Thinking about someone else's wife, someone else's husband. Thinking about some other person. Getting yourself into more situations around them. Then you start 
pushing it a little bit further and you, you end up being alone with that, you know, two people maybe aren't married. They're going on dates. They like each other. And then they start opening up the door more and more for sin. <coughs> they start maybe touching each other a little bit more, giving bigger hugs or starting to kiss or whatever, you know, start just pushing the envelope more and more and then find themselves alone together and then all of a sudden fornication happens. But see, it's not all of a sudden. It's a progression. It's things that happen. It's things that they, they start allowing more and more to, to, to produce that sin. And we need to take heed. We need to take heed lest you fall. It starts with having the mindset that those things really aren't that bad and won't affect them. They say, oh, this might affect other people, but it's not going to affect me. The next thing that happens, they start missing the soul one time. Like I said, the, the, the list just goes on and on and on of, of how it's going to take you down and we need to, to keep ourselves in check. Turn, if you would, to Jeremiah chapter number 3. Jeremiah 2, 3, and I mean pretty much the entire book of Jeremiah is not, it's not a very positive book. Jeremiah 3 specifically, though, mentions multiple times how Israel is backsliding. They're backsliding Israel. Now, to be fair and to put it in context, Israel had gone really far off the deep end as far as their just forgetting the Lord, literally worshiping idols and, and false gods and having nothing to do with God. Like at this point when they came and judgment came, they were in a really bad shape. But we can still make the application, I believe, to ourselves, even if you're not that far gone. Even if you're not just way out in the world to the point to where you're not even coming to church and you've already got your own idols just set up. We're going to use these as an example so that we don't fall into the same uh, judgment as they did. Look at verse number 11 of Jeremiah chapter 3. <clears throat> verse number 11. And the Lord said unto me, The backsliding Israel hath justified herself more than treacherous Judah. And you know what? When it comes to your sins, when it comes to those little things in your life, it's always justifying yourself. Right? There's always a justification for it. There's always a good reason why, oh, this was okay when I did it because fill in the blank. Whatever. You're always going to try to find a way to justify it to yourself. But see, God says, Israel was doing that. Backsliding Israel justified herself more than treacherous Jew. They were given all the reasons why it was okay for what they were doing. And they were making themselves believe that it was okay. But was it really okay in God's eyes? No. Look at verse number 12. Go and proclaim these words toward the north and say, Return, thou backsliding Israel, saith the Lord, and I will not cause mine anger to fall upon you, for I am merciful, saith the Lord, and I will not keep anger forever. This is one thing that we can really, really appreciate and love about God is how merciful He is. Yeah. So when you do catch yourself in these situations, you do catch yourself backsliding, look, you know what God wants the most? He wants you to return. He wants you to come back. He just wants you to get right with him. He wants you just to say, okay, God, I'm sorry. And we'll see that here. Look at verse number 13. Only acknowledge thine iniquity. That's what he wants. That's what he wants. He says, I'm here. I'll be merciful to you. You've screwed up. You've sinned. You've sinned willfully. You've done these horrible things, but come back to me. Acknowledge that you've sinned. Admit that you've done wrong. Admit that what you're... Don't justify yourself. Just say, yeah, I was wrong. And I can tell you the same thing as a parent because God deals with us as his children. You're born again. You're a child of God. God's your father. As a parent, what I want more than anything when my children screw up and when they do wrong and when they know they've done wrong, the last thing I want to hear from them is, but you don't understand, Dad. See, this is why. Look, don't, ex don't make an excuse for yourself. Don't justify what you've done. Just say, I'm sorry, I did wrong. And I'll tell you what, for, from my standpoint, I'm going to be way less severe in the punishment area when they could do that acknowledgement and already have, have, have admit the wrongdoing than trying to make excuses for themselves. If anything, that makes you just more angry. The last thing you want to hear is some excuse why you couldn't obey and listen to what your father said. 
And that's the way God is. He doesn't want to hear your excuses to yourself. He doesn't want to hear why you're justified in sinning. Because if you're going against what he's told us to do or not to do, you're in sin. And that's the bottom line. And you just need to say, I've sinned and I'm sorry. That's what he's looking for. Acknowledge thine iniquity that thou hast transgressed against the Lord. Verse 13, against the Lord thy God. And has scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree, and ye have not obeyed my voice, saith the Lord. Turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. Look at verse 15. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. This is important to note. A lot of people have no respect for churches these days. A lot of people think that church isn't that big of a deal. We talk to so many people saying, oh, well, I go to church right here because I pray to God at home. And they call that church. And I'll tell you what, that's not church. Amen. And look, everyone in this room today, you're in church. Amen. The people who are going to be listening on the internet or watching some video somewhere, you're not in church when you're watching this video. Church is a congregation of people who are gathered together. Church is a God-ordained institution that God wants believers to go to. Amen. He does not want you just sitting at home. The Bible says not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together, as the manner of some is. He's given pastors for you, for your benefit, to feed you, to feed you with knowledge, to feed you with understanding, to help make his words easier to understand to you. God has given pastors. Church is important for that reason. And I'll tell you what, you never know what you are missing when you miss church. We offer three different church services during the week. And, look, and that may be foreign to some people. I know it was for me when I was growing up in the Presbyterian church. We had church one time a week. It was Sunday morning and that was it. Now, if you come to church just Sunday morning, I'm not mad at you. I don't, you know, I don't think less of you. But I think what you need to understand is, first of all, that these are services. These are services doing service for you. I spend a lot of my time and energy and prayer trying to teach God's Word. And every single service, I don't blow off any, any one of those services. If I have to stay up all night preparing sermons and trying to teach people, I'm going to do it. And I, and I have done it. And I think a lot of people don't realize, you, know, you, know, you, just, you show up to church, but you don't realize all the effort that goes into the service for you. God has prepared. I believe that God has ordained for me to be your pastor. Amen. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. I was found fit from the church that sent me out and was trained and taught to do this job and to do this work. And I know for a fact that I've had God's hand upon me. And I am here for you. And I am preparing messages for you. When you miss church service, you don't know what you're missing. God may have worked on the pastor's heart to prepare a sermon that God wanted you to hear. Because look, we all, need we all need learning. We all need admonishment. We all need these various teachings from the Bible in our own personal lives. Myself included. Look, we all need this script, we need, we need the learning from God's Word. And I believe this wholeheartedly. God works in the hearts of the pastors. There, I can't tell you how many times in the past three years people have come up to me afterwards and have said something like, you, you must have been talking directly to me or something to that effect of like, you know, whether it be on a sin or whether it be on something else, you know, this has been going on in my life and you just hit it. And you know what? I had no idea what's been going on in people's lives. And I don't. And if you think, you know, don't get mad at me at some service. If I preach on some sin and I'm railing real hard on something that the Bible teaches, don't get mad at me if, if, if it affects you personally because I probably don't know what's going on. There have been a few occasions where I wanted to preach sermons where I didn't know things were going on. 
But that's also part of being a pastor, of getting things right and making sure there's no false doctrine keep creeping in and things like that. And that needs to happen. But the vast majority of the time, when I'm preparing myself, just to give you a little insight into what I do, I'm praying to God all week. God, help me to preach something that's going to help people in our church. God, lead me to something. Give me some thought. Give me some understanding. Help me to preach whatever it is that our people need to hear. That is always my prayer for you. So when I come up with things, most of the time it's just through my reading or listening to the Bible, something stands out to me and I go with it. Hey, this is a good teaching. Hey, people need to hear this. And that's the way, that's the way it works. And I believe that God might have something that he wants you to hear, but what happens if you don't show up when that, when that sermon's preached? I don't know who it's for. I don't know if there's anyone here this morning that this particular sermon is for. I don't know. Maybe there's not. I'm not going to claim that every single sermon I preach is directly from God. I don't know that. But anybody who's been in church long enough has probably had your life impacted by sermons that you've heard. I know mine has. Being in service for seven years before pastoring, there have been many, many, many times where, wow, I really needed to hear that. Wow, I need to you know, shape up my, my life or whatever. Wow, I need to do more soul winning. Wow, I need to do whatever. I've had lots of, imp I mean, I, I can name so many sermons that have made, meant a lot in my own personal spiritual growth. What would have happened if I wasn't there for those? Don't know. God has given pastors, he says, according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And if God moves a, a pastor, and you know, not just me, any pastor, you go to any church, and if God's moving a pastor to preach this particular sermon, and it's for you, but you don't show up, again, guess whose fault that's not? It's not God's fault. And I'll tell you what, when God wants you to hear something, you can't expect God to just cater to you to when, oh, this person's going to be here on this day, I'm going to make sure he gets that. That's not necessarily the way he's going to do it. Because if God thinks that you should be here maybe more frequently than you are, then he's just going to, there's a message for you. I mean, it's just like people who, uh, you know, with, even just with receiving Christ, getting saved. You know, God will, will, will send, will have a minister for everybody to believe by. But he's not just going to cater, you know, like, oh, I'm busy now. Oh, I've got this other thing going on. You know, and, and, and I'm too busy to hear the gospel. And people just, well, I can't hear it right now, but I want, you know, come back. And, and, and you come back, and then they're still not there. It's not going to, you know, God's just going to keep catering to you over and over and over again. At some point, you just got to be like, I'm here to listen. Proverbs 14, 14, you have to turn. Or turn, if you would, to Joshua chapter 7. It's the last place I'll have you turn. Joshua chapter 7. Proverbs 14, 14 says, The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways, and a good man shall be satisfied from himself. Remember, the title of the sermon was to take heed lest you fall. We want to make sure that we are taking heed to ourselves. One way to take heed is to make sure you're in church and getting the teaching. And I'll make this point too. A lot of times when people fall into sin or start backsliding, they start to feel guilty, and rightfully so. You start thinking, oh man, I did this. And then what happens, though, and this is the worst thing you could do, is that they get out of church. They feel guilty. They feel like, I can't, you know, how can I show my face now? And especially if they've done maybe something pretty serious, right? Some real bad sin. How can I show my face to, at church? You know, I'm ashamed of myself. God's ashamed of me. And then they just get out here. I'll tell you, that's the worst thing you can do. Right. When you recognize you've done wrong, tell God you're sorry, but don't get out of his house. When don't get out of church because the church is here. It's to help to build you back up and to edify you and to help heal and recover from whatever it is that you've done. Okay, whatever's wrong, we're, you know, the church is going to be able to help you with that. When you get out, you have that much less of a godly influence on your life. What are your odds of overcoming that then without having the support and the help that you get through church? Without receiving the teaching, I mean, you're just, you're just shutting yourself off and you're setting yourself up for failure. Hopefully, you know, people in here, 
if you ever find yourself backslidden, okay, take this to heart and remember this. If you don't get anything else from the sermon, take this point. Don't get out of church. Amen. Don't give up. Stick with it. Backslider and heart shall be filled with his own ways. We reap what we sow. It's going to come back around to us. Don't, and don't forget this, that you never just affect yourself when you start to backslide. For the times when you want to just hold on to that sin, when, any sin that you commit, it always has repercussions and impacts on other people whether you realize it or not. You are never just impacting yourself. There's always somebody else that, that's involved that gets hurt. You think, oh, well, I just want to do this one thing. I just want to, you know, listen to this music. I just want to have this drink. I'm only affecting me. No, you're not. And especially in this church, no, you're not. This is a, we have a small church. Everybody knows everybody here. We have a lot of friendships that, that happen in this church, and I think that's a great thing. I think we all should be friends in this church. I think it's a, it's a wonderful you know, uh, thing just to have people who are close to one another. But the problem with, with, uh, with backsliding, though, is that the tendency is that when one person backslides, it's a lot easier to drag other people down with you than to be, to be brought up. It's, it's a lot easier for people to come down than it is to go back up. And when you are willfully sinning and, and you know you're allowing some of your life, and then other people start saying, hey, look at brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so, and they're, you know, they've been coming to church for a long time and they're doing this. They're doing it. It must not be that big of a deal. And then they start doing the same thing too. And then look, we're, we're creatures that we see other people do something and we have a tendency to imitate. We have a tendency to just do what someone else is doing and in our mind, and see, there's where the justification is. I know this is a sin. It's already been proven to me. But I see so-and-so doing it, so it must not be that bad. And if they're doing it, then, I, 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 then they, they know more than I do, so that, you know, this is okay to do. And it has an impact on other people. It has an impact. You know, watch, watch out. The, you know, the way that you live your life and stuff, other people look up to you. You might not, you might not have any idea. I know our kids look up to certain people, people in our family, pe you know, people, friends. That they, I don't even think, themselves know, you know, the people that they look up to, I don't even think even realize it. But our, our children emulate other people. They look at other people as examples. What type of example are you going to be? You're in Joshua chapter 7. This is going to be the last point that I really want to, to, to focus on, is that we remember the sin of Achan. If you remember the story, when Joshua, this is early in the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 7, Children of Israel were going and they were fighting their battles. They're going to they're take over the promised land, right? They're going to conquer the, the enemies and, and defeat the Canaanites and get, inherit the land that God had promised to them. And they, they won their very first battle. And then they go in to their second battle and they lose and they flee before the enemy. And they're wondering why. Why did this happen? Has God forsaken us? And basically, God tells them, no, like, you, you've sinned. And I wanted to point out, look at verse number one. And this is, this is important, and this ties in with exactly what I was saying about it impacting other people. Joshua chapter 7, verse number one, but the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing for Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Look at the very first phrase there. But the children of Israel committed a trespass. Who committed a sin? Who committed a trespass? The children of Israel as a group. How did they do it? In the accursed thing. For Achan, and then it says who he is, the son of Carmel, all that, took of the accursed thing. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. Do you see how one person, what one man's sin, the impact it had on everybody? God was angry with, the entire, with all the children of Israel because Achan partook in the accursed thing. Achan broke God's law. Everybody suffered as a result. People died in that battle as a result of Achan's sin. The children of Israel were treated as a group for the sin of Achan. 
Don't you think that our church will be treated the same way when we have people that just go and partake in you know, the accursed thing, whatever that might be in, in, in any individual's life? Look at verse 19 there in Joshua chapter 7. Jump down to verse 19. We're going to see how it happened unto Achan. He explains himself. He tells an account. He says, this is what happened. This is what I did. Look at verse 19. And Joshua said unto Achan, my son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel and make confession unto him and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. Now there's a sin that Achan committed. He was stealing. Basically stealing from the Lord. They were not supposed to take any of the spoils. That first battle was supposed to go wholly to God. That is not something that he allowed them to, to, to really receive anything for themselves. This is the first fruits. Just the, this is the way God is. This is the way God deals with everything. Look, the first goes to God. The first battle, the spoils go to God. They do not go to you. Achan saw those things, and he probably thought within himself, well, it's not that big of a deal. These people are dead. What's God going to do with a garment anyways? Right? This Babylonian garment. What's he going to do with that? I could use that. I'm poor. I need this. I fought in this battle. So I'm going to take it. Right? He saw it. He covered it. And he took some money. Right? Some, some silver and some gold. Right? A little, little something for himself. How is that going to hurt anybody else? I'm just going to do this. No one's going to see me. This is, this is what I want. He lost it after he took it for himself. It impacted a lot of people. He saw, first of all, he saw the garment, saw the silver, saw the gold. He coveted in his heart, saying, oh man, what I could do with that. Oh, I want that. I, that I, I, that's going to make me feel good. I want that. And then he actually acted and took it. Now, the co he started sinning with the coveting. You don't sin when you see something. The sin started with the covetousness and then finished in him actually taking it. We need to be careful, first of all, what you're allowing into your home, into your eyes, into your ears, and into your hearts. The things that you are allowing yourself to view and, and tempt yourself with. This situation, I'm not saying he was in the wrong and, or was somewhere he shouldn't have been. He might not have been. Sometimes things just get thrown in front of your eyes and you don't really have any control over that. But the, there's a lot of things that we do have control over. There are many, many things that you do have control over as, as far as what's being put in front of you. The internet, the television, the radio, they all broadcast all kinds of stuff. And there is a lot of wickedness being broadcast on those three mediums, which are really popular today. Every vehicle has got a, a radio. Every home pretty much has a TV. Every restaurant has a TV. The gas stations even have TVs. I mean, you go out these days, there's stuff being pumped just, just nonstop. Now, is all of it all wicked all the time? No. But there's a lot of it out there. And you need to be careful what you're allowing to put in front of your face. You need to guard yourself. All you need is that one image, that one song to spark some wicked thought that you then covet and then eventually act on. Music. This is, let's talk about music for a second. Music is a big thing. I don't know about you, but I, had a I have a pretty worldly sinful past. You know what worldly music does for me? Besides just the, the, the message that's being sent, it reminds me of a lot of things. 
Do you think my wife wants me to listen to some song that meant something to me and some other woman? Do you think that's a good thing for me to be listening to some song that's going to remind me of some other woman than my wife? Of course not. And then what's going to happen? Oh, but I just like this song so much and I want to listen to this and it's going to get me thinking about those times. And you know what might happen? Maybe I'll start coveting somebody else then. And then that's where adultery happens. We need to keep guard on this stuff. You think it's not that big of a deal? I say it is. Amen. Amen. Maybe it's not a song. Maybe it's some other image. There's a lot of pornography on the internet. Not that hard to find. It's out there. I mean, sometimes the stuff just pops you in the face. You don't know where you're going. You don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you're clicking on. You get some random email, whatever. Got to watch out for it. You see those things, and then you start to covet. And before you know it, you're acting on it, just like Achan did. And you know what? It's not only going to affect you. Children of Israel are treated as a group as a result of Achan's sin. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. I don't want anyone to fall in 2017 in this church. I want us to grow. I want us to build. I want us to do more. But let's all take heed to ourselves. Let's make the proper uh, you know, adjustments in our life that we're not allowing things to become in front of our eyes. You know, you could be in the best church in the world. And I think we have the best church in the world right here. Amen. You could have everything there to help keep you on track. You have everything going for you. You have the right people surrounding you. But it all comes down to you in the end. You've got... God that's trying to help you. God who promised not to put you through any temptation that's, that you can't get through. He's made that promise. You have people here, you've got a pastor here that promises to preach and to teach everything that, that, that I can think of that you need to hear that God will lead me to teach and dedicated to serving you. You've got people around you that are here to help you out and, and to get you through those times. We've got people all around you, but at the end of the day, it comes up to you. You have to make the decisions in your own life. You end up being responsible for yourself and you have to justify your own actions not only to yourself but more importantly to God. Let's take heed as we progress into this new year to ourselves. Let's think about our actions. Think about what we're doing. Think about what we're allowing to influence us in our, in our life and Nip those things in the bud. And look, I know none of us is perfect, but let's not use that as an excuse either. Well, none of us is perfect. So that's just an excuse to go ahead and do whatever the sin I want to do. Let's say, yeah, none of us is perfect, and God knows that and he'll be merciful if I could just say, this is a sin. And I'm not going to do that anymore because I want to serve God. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much. For your words, dear God, I pray that you would please help us all to take heed to ourselves, Lord. Help us not to get caught up. Even in the, as, as the Bible says, you know, the children of Israel rose, you know, sat down to eat and they rose up to play. Let's not be distracted with just the amusement and entertainment in this world and just having fun. It's okay to have fun, Lord. We'd, we love to have a good time. We thank you for all the blessings that we have in this world and, and the enjoyment that we could receive through fellowship and family and, and just other things, dear Lord, but help us to, to maintain a proper focus that we're not just here to please ourselves. We're here to serve you. And, and that is the ultimate goal, dear Lord. Help us all to be uh, better servants. Help us all to take heed to ourselves and make sure that we're, not, that we're, that we're staying on guard and not allowing things to, uh, to influence us that would be negatively influencing us and causing us to sin, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.